This is the It's Time to Refresh podcast with Brad Refresh, the podcast about life, music, traveling, shit, literal shit that is, and weird and wacky stories with Brad and a range of guests from the planet Earth. Feel free to share the pod with your pals, your mom, your neighbor's dog, or even your shrink. It's all fun. You can follow our Facebook group called It's Time to Refresh Community or It's Time to Refresh on Instagram. Write into the pod, ask questions, and share your stories. Enjoy the pod! Hey kid, what time is that? It's time to refresh! Uh, back once again with another podcast. This is episode 42 of the podcast, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it is. Um, and on this one, we've got what I would call hard house royalty. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Tom Parr. Um, he's been around for... Oh, when did you start out, mate? Sorry. Uh, 14. So you were, you were 46 now. Oh, so he's been around a long while. Um, I, I've heard his, his tunes for years. Um and he's got a very distinctive hard house sound. Um, and basically, I've just come down today. Uh, I've, had, I've had a couple of hard house DJs on in the past, but I think you're the first where you are like, um, your main style is is basically hard house. Yeah. So um, we'll get into your story, mate. How are you doing anyways? I'm very well, thank you. Um, you're going to be the first person, by the way, that's going to that's gonna be doing this. We only... Uh, decided this on the last episode. Someone come up with this really good concept okay. of just as a little icebreaker to get into it. What did you have for tea last night? Oh, I had pigs in blankets, Yorkshire puddings, potatoes, <laughs> gravy, carrots, and cabbage. Wow, nice. <laughs> I wish I never. I wish I had food before I came here today. <laughs> but yeah, that's great. Uh, nice little icebreaker. So I just want to ask you how you're doing and what you're up to currently. Well, I'm currently working on my album. Yep. Um, that's everything I'm doing at the moment. I'm not engineering, uh, not DJing, I'm not gigging. Yep. Um, it's album, 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 because that uh, is due out in June. Right. So how, how, how do you find it focusing all your energy on, on the one thing? Is it extremely difficult? Yeah. Uh, yeah. How many tracks are you looking to put out on the album? I'm doing 12 originals. Yep. And I'm doing a run of 50 to 100 CDs, and there'll be two extra tracks only available on the CD. Right. Uh, then when they're gone, it'll all be USBs. So, yeah, so there's going to be 14 tracks on the CD, yep. 12 on the USB. Excellent, excellent. And have you gone for the... Are you alright talking about the album yeah. or something really? Um, have you gone for the real like Tom Parr sound or is oh, it yeah, a, 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 a variation or what, what have you? It's just me all over from is start it? to finish. It's I think just, a lot of people will be happy with that. It's hard, it's fast, it's vocal, hoovers, yeah. acid. But it's the very best of me. Excellent, excellent. So we'll sort of go right back to the beginning with you. Okay. Um, who's, who's Tom Parr? Where are well, you from? I'm from Chorley. I was born in Chorley, raised in Chorley. Um, my mother's from Chorley. Yep. My dad's from Birmingham. Right. That's where the music comes from, my dad's side. So my dad's dad, my granddad, was a professional clarinet player in the Birmingham Royal Orchestra. Wow. He also taught piano. Um, my dad is a grade eight guitarist, played in bands all his life. Um, so I was brought up around a musical family. What's, what style of, of bands are we talking? We're talking rock, uh, you know, yeah. sort of uh, that 80s rock, that, you know. Like glam rock or like? Uh, no, like, uh, I think he did all sorts of it. I think once he was in a Simply Red cover band. Fantastic. Yeah, so <laughs> he, 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 was, uh, he could play... He was the guy, he could hear anything and play it on the guitar instantly. That's amazing, yeah. amazing. So yeah, um, so what was it like growing up then? Um, musically, uh, I wasn't into dance music at, at all until about 13. I was into my bands, Finn Lizzy, yeah. you know, all the sort of the old rock 
stuff. I am a fan, by the way. Yeah. Um, and then um, my mum and dad got divorced. Um, my dad moved out. <clears throat> And my sister started seeing this guy called Mark Howard, okay. who I ended up, uh, I, my first vinyl signing I made with him. Um, anyway, he had a pair of 1210s and he ended up moving in and uh, he taught me how to mix. And that's what got me into Hard House because he played like Wig and Pier stuff and, yeah. you know, the old... Um, um, record shop in Wigan what was it called now Power Records, Power Records yeah. Uh, so yeah then but I was always interested in how how have they made that I wasn't that bothered about mixing it because I picked that up very quickly yeah. fortunately yeah. Um, so then I was like that's all very well and everything but how have they made that music <laughs> and then that's how I started on my path of you know um I started looking wherever I could. There wasn't really much internet then, so it was yeah. all magazines or word of mouth, really. Yeah. Um, and luckily, I had a friend at the time in high school, a clever lad called Daniel, and um, he was dead good on computers, and, and, and he turned out to be into music too, and uh, he got me into the, the production side of it. Right. Um, if it wasn't for him, I don't think... I'll be here today, really. Right. Mm. So what year was this then? When you, you, you I don't know if I... <laughs> so I was about... I started mixing at about 13, started yeah. producing on a computer at about 14. Right. Mm. So when when you were, like, um, take, like, taking these tracks apart in your head and stuff to figure out how it works, what were the sort of tunes you were listening to? So you said, like, Wigan Pier Power Records It stuff. was... Yeah, so it was all Wigan Pier, sort of the classic bounce sound before they ruined it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it you know, the, the old, like, club heads... Um, you know, Ben T, Mikey B, all yeah. that kind of stuff. And then it slowly started um, to get a bit harder. So, yeah. you know, Tidy was the main. Uh, tidy, Nucleus, yeah. Riot, uh, Traffic, uh, Flashpoint. Do you remember Flashpoint yeah, Records? Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I I kind of had... Dan Bounce got a bit chavvy yeah. for me. Personally, it got a bit too. I know what you mean. Like yeah, cheesy. Or, or yeah, what? it got. It, it went from. It changed. Yeah. At a certain point, I didn't like it anymore. It got too commercial. If you were, when they started sampling pop vocals and yeah. putting a donk behind it, that yeah. was enough for me. Yeah. So then I, I was always into before I got into hard house. I always liked the heavy metal end anyway of bands, the harder yeah. stuff. So when I discovered Hard House, which was my first time was an old Fergie C D when right. Fergie played Hard House. And um I don't I don't know you know these old CDs, these bootlegs they used to sell in record shops, yeah. DJs, mixes and stuff. Just yeah. on one of them. Yeah, like a blank C D just but, do you know what the mix was at all? Or, or like you've later they discovered what the mix it, was? No, it but it did have um a, uh it just no. I'll no. just <laughs> no. But it was a hard house. It was the harder end of hard house. So it had... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of some records. UK Gold. Yeah. Um, fantastic thing on it. And, you know, all it's that. It's a big bounce anthem, that as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. Yeah. Origi you... Originally hard house, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah, um, that's... Then I was like, what is that stuff? And then I started looking at artists like Mark Johnson, R. R. Theus, yeah, Paul Glasby, uh, and so on. You can see your sound really developing as well. You can see you can see that when you hear your music and it's very much like hard Glasby with Wig and Pier. Yeah. You mix them together and you've got me. <laughs> really. Yeah. So um when was your your first sort of you you've gone out to a rave? Like you were saying about mixing and that but what, what was your first experience of going into a nightclub? Uh, well, I was taking ecstasy at 14. Fantastic. <laughs> um, my first rave, it was my first rave, probably in a local labour club. Right. We had uh, Ben T come down from Wigan. Oh, wow. Someone had put it together and, and uh, it wasn't a club club, but that yeah. was the first sort of experience. 
don't remember a lot of it. Right. Um, but my first proper club experience was at Good Grief. Well, all right, nice, nice. Mm. Where was that, sorry? Phillips Park Hall in Manchester. Very nice. And was that you, was, would you say that was you fully converted then to the... the... Y- yeah, I went to see uh, Tidy Boys played Eddie Halliwell. Um, I got the Tidy Boys autograph, actually, that night. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Mm. <laughs> Uh, what, what a vinyl or? Uh, no, uh, it was off a, uh, a case of a vinyl. Oh, right, right, label. Okay. They just ripped it off and signed it for me. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so you, you're sort of like starting to discover these these like these sounds and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, your, your first production as such, were you what were, what were you taking the inspiration from? Um, Anything, uh, to be honest, I was just trying to learn how to do it. So for the first, I'd say it took me two years to learn. Well, actually, I started out on a a program called Mod Plug. Never even heard of that. Yeah, that's how old it is. (laughs) And then I went on to Reason. Yeah. And then I went on to Fruity Loops. Finally, it ended on Fruity Loops when I was 16, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then it took me two years to fully learn the program inside yeah. out, and then I was able to then start making music. So when when you were starting out, what were you doing? Were you were you sampling off Hard House Records? So all samples. So um, back then, VSTs were just out, yeah, and it was all cracked. Yeah, um, I I wouldn't even know where to buy them from at that time. Yeah, we just had a friend that just so had happen to have them all yeah so the vsts like vanguard v station uh what else z3 ta they are all the <laughs> first vsts i had they, yeah. They, uh, yeah vanguard yeah. is still it's still going yes. they've got a new one out vanguard yeah. too uh, that that Z- Zeta. I call, I've always called it Zeta. Zeta yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, Zeta was a bit like hit and miss for me, but it's it's interesting to to see that that they were your first programs because yeah. for me that they were like the. Well, I remember when I was getting into it, people were like, "Oh, these are the essentials you need to make to make a bounce." Obviously, you had no clue or whatsoever. And I was like, yeah. "Right, okay, okay." Uh, and then there was a, a few interesting sounds on there. Yeah, uh, I remember Zeta as a pre That mm. that was. Uh, one of the better ones. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I got busy with that. Then I had my first release at 16. I don't remember what label it was. And then I got my first ever vinyl signing. Oh, great. Uh, which is Saltwater, which was a white label. Excellent. And then I went on to be on about 14 different vinyls, but I don't, these are the only ones I got sent. <laughs> Um, for the audio listeners right now, we're just having a, a little look through some of the vinyls that's been pressed. That's excellent, mate. It's a it's a nice it's a nice feeling to have your music in your hand, isn't it? Like, like I know digital <laughs> nowadays, it's it's thing, but yeah, but yeah, it's it, it's good. So, what was the first record that was you would say is good enough that got signed? What? Oh, oops. Um, <laughs> well, this one, Saltwater. That was at eighteen. That. And and can you remember the feeling of, of the... But how, how did the conversation go? When so, I made this... I made that bootleg, you know, chicane, salt water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I sent it back then. It was when you sent promos out to DJs. Yeah. And it was back when MSN was a yeah. thing. There was no Facebook. It was MySpace and MSN. Yeah. So I reached out to uh, several different DJs. Mark Johnson picked it up and he was playing it in clubs and it became word of mouth. And then a label contacted me and said, can we sign it? And I was like, yeah. Oh, that's great. And they gave me a £150 advancement. Yeah. Uh, they sent me a copy, a few copies actually. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that that... That almost set me up to fail because that gave me a naivety about the music scene and how it worked. Yeah. Because that is not how it normally works. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so the, the, you would, I think it was just one of them where it was just... I was lucky. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah. So going forward then, have you got that little bit of a boosting confidence of like, oh, my music, no. people want to hear my music? No. Is not it? at all. I think no. um, it was all London-based, a lot of it. I didn't drive. I still don't drive. Yeah. So, 
I was unaware of the buzz about me. Yeah. And plus the internet wasn't really a thing. Yeah. So unless you were in the club in scene, it was all word of mouth. Um, so I didn't really know um, how successful my music was doing. Yeah. Until I moved down to London and everyone knew who I was. They knew my name, which was very surreal. Yeah. Strangers knowing your name. Can, can I ask you something, by the way, before we move on? Um, yeah. Did, was the, the ch move to London for the music? Or yeah. was it yeah. personal? Uh, well, uh, a bit of both. I got uh, an Asbo, kicked out my flat because of loud music. Right. And I was seeing somebody at the time who lived in Portsmouth and she offered if I moved down. So, right. So then I did and I stayed there for four years. How was London? As a northerner going down, I just because I don't know many people. I, I've got maybe one or two friends who've actually moved to London. And it's a shit hole. Yeah, they're, they're exactly the same. Yeah, it's very expensive, extremely rough. Yeah, dirty. Uh, it's not for me. <laughs> so I, I know I'm, I, I keep asking, but what sort of year did you move down? Was it roughly? Do you, I do you was twenty-one. 20, so, twenty-one, and then I was twenty. 24, 25 when I come back. Right. Yeah. So so at this point you've went down, people are recognising you, people are seeing, oh, this is this is Tom Parr who did this this tour and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, how was that for you? Because, as you say, these are strangers. Uh, I felt like an imposter. <laughs> I felt I uh, definitely had imposter syndrome. I don't uh, think that ever leaves, by the way. I, no. I, I still get it all the time now. Yeah, like, I do. I do. Yeah. It's like I'll make a track or something and then I'll, and the next day I'll, you have this voice in your head saying it's not good enough. Yeah. It's, it's not right that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, back to your question. Yeah, it was very surreal, very strange, and I felt like it was almost undeserved. Yeah. Because I'd never experienced anything like that before. Yeah. Did it make you want to drive harder though? Because you obviously you get that feeling of undeserved, but like it's like, right, well now I need to feel like I deserve it. No, it, it, if anything, it just added more pressure. Yeah. Because then um, up, uh, I started engineering around that time. So then people expect a certain level, Yeah. you know? So it just added pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, you do get used to it eventually, kind yeah. of. So when it was when it was happening, what was the the situation like? Like, so you you're going out now in London to these raves. Like, yep. what was what was on at the time so of, of the time? It was frantic. I was playing. Um, we had a deal with Frantic. I started off where I get twenty five pound, and it yep. go up twenty five pound every gig. I think I got to seventy quid, and then I got banned because. I got caught pissing in a shed in the smoking area. Oh, right. <laughs> but there's a good reason for right, that. Okay. So there was a giant queue, which yeah. I thought I didn't know, but that was for the cubicles, not the urinals. Right. And I was dying. Anyway, I, had, I, I spied a shed in the smoking area for that all day. Yeah. Little did I know the bouncers had seen me walk in there. I got caught in the act. I got kicked out and I hadn't even played my set yet. Right. I had to then convince them that I was who I was said I was. Yeah. I played my set and then I got escorted out again, and that was that. Fantastic. That that's a story and a half. <laughs> but yeah, so the, you you probably got like quite around at the time where it's quite busy and oh, like yeah, I was rammed. Like, yeah, I the, was playing to the main room. Uh, excellent. So how many people were there, sort of roughly? Well, it's hard. To, it's probably like. I don't know, three, four hundred tops. Yeah. Not, not a matter. Yeah. But well, that was big at the time. You were know. you, for instance, so were you playing a lot of your, old, your own stuff, yeah? Most of the time it was all my own stuff when I played. It was very rarely I'd play other people's stuff. Um, more. This is more of a, a psychological side of DJing, I'm sort of say. Yeah. But what, it's a good feeling when you see somebody dance to your record. So when you've, you've went into this room, this is this is something that a lot of people talk about within the scene at this event yeah and you've played your record is it did you did you get that buzz no no because i'm i'm so busy and trying to make sure I'm, everything's right yeah yeah I, I want my set to be spot on so 
I barely look up, to be honest. Oh, really? Mm. Uh, that's interesting. Very much like Paul Glasby, straight face. Yeah. Just fucking getting on with it. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. So, so while you've been down in London, have you got any uh, stories that you like to share? Uh, a lot of late nights, early mornings, a lot of drugs, yeah. a lot of drink. Uh not standard rave scene, isn't it really? Yeah, there, there wasn't really that many, uh, apart from the frantic story, I suppose. Um, yeah. um, sort of very much A to B sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. a lot of travel. I mean, you get constantly on the motorway and, and that I remember just just travelling and it's constantly night time, it felt like, all yeah. the time. And then you get to a gig and then... The worst ones is when you've got two gigs in one night because then, yeah, I hate that. You'd have to turn up, play your gig, then back. You, you could never settle, you know. You that, that's I think I, it's only happened to me a couple of times because of my own stupid fault. I've always made sure that for me, for instance, I, I like to just do the one gig in one night where yeah, yeah. you don't over push yourself. And there's been times where I've accidentally said yes to a gig months and months and months before. Mm. And then I've been booked for a gig and I'm like, yeah, I'm free that night and I've, I've forgot to note it down and it's come out the same night. Mm. And it's only ever happened a handful of times. And do you know when you were saying about imposter syndrome before? Yeah. When you go in and play that set and then disappear, that you, you feel like such a, you feel like shit, a you? disconnect yeah. to everyone else because you know you're just there for a flying visit. And I found as well with the gigs, the um, uh, there was no, what's the word? With the equipment, so the equipment varies vastly from club to club. Yeah. And I got sick and tired of, of like, just substandard equipment, yeah. substandard setups, and, and not being able to hear what I'm doing. Yeah. And the problem is, when you become a name, or, you, you know, or you're getting paid money, a significant amount of money for a set, yeah. and you're, you play a terrible set, people remember that. Yeah. You know, and... And so it's quite frustrating because they just think, oh, what well, these shit. And it's the first impression always sticks as well. Yeah. So, for instance, you could turn the, to a, I don't know, a, a, a low-budget event that you've been booked for. Yeah. You go there, it's a bad setup. You play a bad set, but there's a guy who's came or a girl that's come to see you for the first time. Mm. And they're like, this isn't what I was expecting. I and think my worst sticks. ever one was there was no monitor and no headphones. Right. Uh, yeah, work that out. Yeah, right. Um, well, to be fair, I've I have turned up to gigs and there's been no monitor, and you have to just work with what you've I got. I can do headphones, but have you yeah. ever done no headphones, no monitor? No, just uh, you got to mix off the club system with a two second delay. Yeah, it's not good. I can't imagine it sounds very good either. Oh, it's uh, it the longest hour of my life. <laughs> hey, could you just feel like shit the whole time? Yeah, like, everyone's yeah, watching. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's like, what, what's going on? And you, you can't like just go. Oh, and by the way, everyone. I haven't got a monitor or just turn everything down. Just letting just you all know that I mean, yeah. I'm normally a lot better than this. <laughs> <laughs> That's quality. But uh, I'm, I've got, as I told you off pod, I'm a bit of a technophobe. So I've like, yeah. I, I embrace new things, absolutely. I'm not like, oh, how do you do this? Yeah. But I've always got this horror feeling of things going wrong. That's why I've got spare wires and everything in the bag. And, um, I, to gigs, I take two sets of headphones just in case one cuts out. And you know what would set me off if it was an Allen and Heath mixer? I'd shit my pants because I hated them. Yeah. Because they, I think at the time you couldn't do uh, both tunes in the headphones on the Allen and Heath mixers. Right. And um, I can mix both ways, you know, with yeah. one ear off and one ear off, but I prefer to do both. Was it, was, the, was it the split? They didn't have the split you decision, did Yeah, they? there was no split. I remember, yeah, you yeah, could yeah. only do it in one ear and and so I, that always put the fear of God into me if that was the mixer because I'd be like, oh. <laughs> I remember turning up to a gig in Morecambe um, about 10 years ago and it was amazing because, do you know when some when you say about setups and stuff, yeah. one was so bad but yet so good. So turned up, it was an Alan Heath mixer. A lot of people do prefer them, but for me, it's just like mm. if they're not... <laughs> They're not good enough, I don't think. For me, it's just the the, the listening thing. Yeah. The mix itself, I didn't mind. It was the fact that I couldn't have... T 
two tunes in the headphones at once. Yeah. I think it's just because I'm not used to it as well. That was another thing. So I turned up and it had this uh, four like channel mixer. sliders and stuff on The sliders are like a runway as well. Yeah, you have to like, yeah. proper, like put your arm <laughs> up to get to the top. Uh, you can't you can't do anything fancy with them mixers. Like. No. Um, and then, but when I turned up, it had them. And it had, uh, at the time, it was brand new, just came out. It was the, the silver edition uh CDJ 2000s. Oh, yeah. So yeah, it yeah. had this like really old Hall and Anith mixer in the middle, and then either side it had the CDH. I was like, what is going on here? This is a, uh, <laughs> this is um, boggling, like yeah. ridiculous. And I think the second time I went back there, they'd actually got the the, the DGM 2000, which oh, was nice. a bit better. Oh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's weird how you can have such a different budget for different things within the club. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think, yeah, that kind of got tiresome. And then when you get to a level, it, it actually becomes detrimental to you as an artist because if it's not set up right and people come and see you and you don't play well, they might not come and see you again. Yeah. And um, so it's that's part and parcel of being a DJ, but I'm not a DJ yeah. for the first and th foremost. Yeah. And I'm going to play my own music, so it's just the way it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you've you've decided to come to come back to Chorley did you when you came yeah, back so I came back to Chorley um, my relationship ended and the music was just sort of drying up by that yeah. point um, well when I say drying up it, nobody was getting a shot you know no one was allowed a foot in and, yeah. it, and even if you did you get like a back room or yeah uh, <clears throat> so I came back to Chorley and um, just, uh, I had a child, I had my son. Yeah. Um, and I had some time out. And then about 10 years ago, when I had my son, I kind of started making the music again. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. And then I think this is when I heard of you, so pre that. Yeah, I think yeah. You would have heard of me when I got back and... Yeah, kind of stopped, if you will. Yeah, so I I remember hearing your stuff and I like I was searching you, but it, it, you could see that you had a bit of a history within the hard house scene. So I just thought you'd been around for like for a while. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I've got a little bit of that history. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I just thought you'd been you'd been around a while. So uh, I just assumed, oh, this I'll look dig deep into his stuff, find find your music and stuff like that. Yeah, and then I think I heard you on you were guest mixing for someone and then that's when I thought oh this this guy's good I can't remember who it was for um, let me see I'm, I'm, I've stalled Re myself recently here recently or old no it was when I first heard of you I think he could have been might have been Andy Whitby's hardcast uh, yes it I was, was I was going to say I that I think I was his first the guest. first guest yeah, on it yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. so I, I, heard, I heard your stuff and I was like oh this is interesting this because yeah. um, there is a bit of a hard house scene up in my area or was uh, where are you and, from? Um, I'm from Cumbria, so there was um, there used to be the Dreamland event um, that was quite yeah, popular. So, so like, do you know Lee Mills and all that? Like? Yeah, Mills has been on the podcast. Oh, that's right. Yeah, uh, Andy Kelly's been on the podcast. He he was another hard house DJ within the scene. And yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. So yeah, we've, uh, as I say, the, there was a bit of a, a bit of a scene in my area of of, of hard house. Yeah. And at the time, it was the just after the recession and uh, clubs and everything started to come back, but the hard house nights were just in, like, pubs, like small bars, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like, you're not filling a nightclub with, no. with a hard house night. Yeah. So there was, so they had, we had a few guests up and stuff, and you'd, I think I went, I only went to a couple of the nights, but you, you would, your tunes would be played, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. the, you, you, to me, when I heard your guest mix, and then I'd, I'd, I'd hear your tunes being played, I just thought you were like a staple within the the, right. the, the, the hard house world. Do you know what I mean? Well, and, I guess I am. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I am. So, uh, as I say, when I, when I introduced you, it was hard house royalty. To me, <laughs> I've heard you choose and you've been around a, a while. Yeah. It's, 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 it's how it is, isn't it? Um, so, sort of 2011, 2012, you've came back. Yeah. What what did you come back with a, with a bang? Was it was, was a big tunes or...? Um, I did um, Missing You. So, in fact, I did Missing You in Portsmouth. Yeah. And I got interviewed live on Radio 1 by Dave Pierce. Excellent I, achievement. I won Bedroom Producer 
of the month. He did a competition each month. And right. I won it with Missing You. Excellent. So he interviewed me live and played the track. Yeah. Um, and then, then when I came back, Andy Whitby picked it up. Yeah. Wanker. You can say what you want, mate. This <laughs> is the job podcast. <laughs> um, that dolphin head prick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll clip it if you want to put it out. <laughs> Keep it in. He's a cunt. Yeah. So Thanks for that £400, Andy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you've got mi- Missing You. You can go, do you want to go into that if you want? Um, yeah, so Missing You. Andy Whitby took that off me, raped it, got 11 remixes made. What was this for? Was, was it for a label, was it? For his... Uh, awesome oh the called. awesome yeah I remember the awesome stuff yeah, yeah. and he, he got 11 people to remix that I believe yep and then um, he basically sorted his mates out right and I got shafted right I got paid in the end though so your your yours was the, yours you engineered the original how did it work I engineered the original uh, the vocal uh, was by Kim English so it wasn't my vocal yeah uh, so nobody should have made any money from it technically, yeah. but people yeah. did except me. Yeah. Uh, so that was my beginning uh, relationship with that weasel. Yeah. Um, he then, I think I did a few. He, he did like a sub label called Olson Tom Park, and I put out a couple, uh, and he was just he's just a snake in the grass. So. Right. Well, well, did you find these tunes were, were, were doing well for you? Were you, were you? Um, I, uh, yeah, everyone was playing them, but yeah. I, I wasn't seeing or hearing anything back because I was going through a, the wrong person. Right, ah, sure. right, okay, that makes sense. So I got used and abused and, you know, that, that was a lesson very well learnt. I suppose if you, if you were trying to find, like, a positive in all the negatives, it's, it's primed you for the future. Like oh yeah yeah like for instance sin records might not have been a thing if if that if that never happened yeah so I I, I always say I wouldn't change a thing because it wouldn't have happened I mm. needed to that to happen in order for me to be on my own path okay and um, yeah it was hard at the time it wasn't very nice and you know I wouldn't wish it on anybody but in order to grow sometimes you have to go through some. You know, not very nice things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this this tune sort of been big for you, and you've done a couple of yeah, so side bits. It, it was that big that uh, it was on a TV advert. So Gamma's remix yeah. um, ended up on this hardcore album, which did a TV ad. Um, so it, my name was up on on an advert. That's that's a massive achievement, by the way. Until you find out you're not getting paid any money for it. That's the downside to it, but <laughs> yeah. But that that gave me a good insight into the pitfalls of the music industry and what yeah. can happen yeah. um, if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. And, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was put my trust into somebody that um, took advantage of that, essentially. Yeah. Um, but without that, I would never have learned the lessons I know today. It makes sense. It makes sense, mate. Um, but as I say, from from there, you've you've went forward, and you are you doing stuff over labels as well. So I've got uh, stuff on Tidy, Vicious Circle, Flashpoint. Was this around the, all around the same time here? Uh, throughout my the various times. So right, um, Vicious Circle. Uh, I've had f- throughout the years. Flash yeah. Flashpoint. Um, Some really, really big labels as well within the scene, oh, yeah. like the, the, the creme de la creme sort of thing. Yeah, so th- this was before I'd even started my label. So when I, like, pretty much everything I made got was getting signed, everything. Yeah. So then, after all the nonsense and, and money issues and learning how the business works, um, that... Um, is what pushed me forward to think, right, well, I'll do it myself. Yes. Okay. Mm. So, do you want to go into that then? Yeah, so th- I was putting out free music. Yeah. I, I, I kind of thought, it's not going to happen, this. I'll just put out free music and I, I just make it for myself anyway. Yeah. And they w- I was getting hundreds of downloads, thousands of plays on them. Um, so, 
the logical step was, well, why not to start selling it? Yeah. So then I needed a label. Um, and that's how I came up with Sin Records. Uh, what what does what does Sin? Where did that come from? What was it? Is it a well? A lot of hard house labels. You got Vicious Circle, yeah. Flashpoint. Yeah. You know they're all about the harder end. So yeah. I thought, well, you got good and you got evil. Yeah. So okay. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. I get so that. Go with Sin. Right. And that's how I came. Uh, up with what Sin. was the first release? First release. Did it, you? Did you? Pay more attention to the first release, so you, so you, as a, as a point of this is what the sound's going to be with a label. Or uh, my first release was a track called "No One Else Will Do." I think. Yeah. I think, and Ben Stevens did a really good remix of it. In fact, it's better than my original. <laughs> <laughs> he's um, a good producer, Ben. Right? He's very music. good. Yeah, he's a top bloke as well. Um, yeah. So no, I just, I just. For I, I needed a label to put my own stuff on. One of the reasons as well was that there was a backlog with labels. They all had um, um, like a three month release date waiting list. And I wanted it out now. Yeah, yeah. So that was another reason why I wanted my own label because usually if I release a tune, it's because I've got the master back the day before. Yeah. Every time. So if you ever see my music out, it's only just been mastered the day before. <laughs> is it keen, I, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I, I didn't see the point in like now. There is no need in promo, promos, sending promos to DJs yeah. with the internet. So that's gone. Yeah, and I, and I don't see the point in having to wait three months anymore. What about? I'm just being your devil's advocate. Here. Yeah. What about building like anticipation for a record? Maybe put like you see nowadays a lot of people put a, a video up in the studio. It's like a, just a ten, maybe a ten second clip or. That's cool. Um, I do agree with that. But yeah. I think. Because um, do you not think? I'm, as I say, devil's advocate again. Yeah. People want instant the instant hit of because uh, yeah, we would call it the TikTok generation. Yeah. If they haven't caught your attention in say thirty seconds or whatever, they'll just move on to the next thing. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I think promotion is something I'm still learning yeah um, yeah so I think uh, promotion I've got more to learn on that front um, and really you should have a release schedule but I just can't stand waiting <laughs> excellent mate so um, moving forward have you, I, obviously I do keep an eye on what everyone's doing within the scenes mm -hmm. um uh, what was your thought process sort of going forward when when this came out? Were you planning on having other people on the on the label, or were you planning on engineering for, pe for people and offering them to put it on the label? Or um, originally it was just for me. Yeah, uh, and then um, I was engineering, and someone said, "Can I? Well, can you put it on Sin?" And I said, "Yeah," and then that was the start of that. Bit of that yeah. Um, but no, originally it was just for me to put my own music out, and and also I was just fed up with people telling me I was getting told one thing off the fans, yeah, and another off DJs or label owners, yeah. So the fans were saying we love this, yeah. but then a label will be like, oh, you need to change this, you need to do that, and I just thought, well, why not bypass these and go straight to my fans? And I don't have to listen to, you know. Do you think the label, the the record label things are dying thing? Hundred percent. Because if you look at Spotify now, you can't go and search like you can on Discogs for like a record label, unless they made a playlist, of course. Yeah. But you can't like, oh, do you know what the I mean? The rec record labels. Uh, yeah, it, it'll always be there. You'll always need a label to yeah. put the music on. That might change to online, like Spotify. It might yeah. end up just going straight to Spotify. But you don't think record labels, maybe not, it hasn't filtered down to the hard house scene or the bounce scene or anything like that. But if you look at the majors now, mm. a lot of record labels just seem to come across as management labels rather than... That's all it is, really. I it's, just, it's just another platform to put your music on, isn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, now anybody can start a label. Yeah. Uh, which is... We've got an influx of terrible music because no of quality control. Yeah, right. Yeah. Which I love, by the way, because it just makes me sound even better than I am. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. You've got that element to it as well. <laughs> um, 
So so I'm moving forward after you kick the, the, the label and that off. Uh, are you still active with gigs and stuff? No. So I stopped taking gigs. Um, I mean, I'm open to it, but I don't actively look for gigs anymore. I think it's a fool's game. Yeah. It's... I mean, for me as a, a producer, artist, or whatever you want to call it, I, I want to play to a crowd, you know? Yeah. And, um, a crowd who want to see you as well. Like, yeah. It's not just a crowd who are there for the sake of being there. I think a lot's got to change in the scene because it's, you know, you can't just be a DJ anymore. And there needs to be some room for art, like actual artists. Because there isn't. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's like... There's not many of us. I'd say there's a handful of, I don't know, five, six, seven proper artists in Hard House that, yeah. that just all do it themselves. Yeah. I think personally there should be a, a room for these people. Uh, there's a lot, like Dave Owens is one of my favourite producers. Fantastic producer. I hardly ever see him get booked. But, yeah. And he's the best. He yeah. is the, in my opinion, the best hard house producer. He's a good tinkerer, isn't he? He's very good, very yeah. good, and yet he never gets gigs. And yeah. but he's a phenomenal DJ too. Yeah. And um, I've never seen him. I can't say if he's a DJ. I've never seen him live, so I don't know. I've seen him live. I've seen, and uh, you know, his mixes are phenomenal. And yeah. he's one of the guys that again <clears throat> just got been shunned in a way. Mm. He should be. He should be headlining every weekend, but he's not. Yeah. Right. It's mad. Uh, so who who are the big faces for you right now in the hard house scene? So obviously you... you, you uh, Dave you. Owens. Yeah. Um, I love uh, Ben Stevens' work. Yeah. Uh, Paul Maddox. Yeah. Uh, and Don Sweeten. I'm not sure I've heard it. Defective audio. Oh, right. Yeah, sorry. I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, this is, uh, as I say, I, I agree with you, by the way. I think they're very talented guys and they put, do put out some good music yeah. and a range as well there's a big range within oh yeah uh, i've noticed that even with your sound as well a lot of the the music is um it's 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 there's a big wide variety of avenues you go down when you produce a track yeah so for instance like um there's a lot of inspiration from obviously your obvious hard house from back in the day, mm -hmm. but there's stuff. There's like bits of techno in there. There's bits of. Do you know? Do you know where I'm coming from? There is a yeah, bit yeah. of of like a groovy sort of house music as well. Um, and with them names you named off there, it's it's the same with them as well. I mean, it's progressed a lot. Like I think we're in a good place musically in hard house. Like I enjoy the mix of hard and vocal. Yeah, that's my bag. Yeah. So, and. I was doing that before it was even popular. I remember mm. people shunning my stuff because it had vocals in it. Yeah. Because filth was big at the time. Yeah. And um, the, the, I think you said earlier, but you know about my sound and and I was saying how it wasn't always popular because yeah. it took me a long, hard slog of just keep Consistency, doing it. Yeah, 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 keep yeah. doing it and doing it, and eventually all the haters fade away and. You know, you left to do your own thing, and that's good. Um, yeah, I was coming down today, and I put one of your mixes on just to, to sort of refresh my memory with, with some of your stuff. Mm. And there's a tune that, that it's you start off with it on, on one of your vocal mixes. It's um, a cover of oh my god, the one with the saxophone. In. Miss you forever. Is that Miss you? Is that what it's called? Miss you forever. Oh my god, I heard that. I was like, wow, this is uh, it's so close to bounce music, but yet so in depths of. Of yeah. hard house, it's it's crazy. It's really really good riff on that as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, a lot of, I, a lot of my inspiration is from the old bounce. Yeah, you know, it's just I just don't like the modern sound take yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Also, while I've got you, I've got a friend. He's got a sound. There's a that he, I said I'd ask you if you know where it's from because he's been trying to search for it and I've not been able to help him. So here I am live on the podcast. Uh, this could go really wrong for me and I could yeah. be really embarrassed and not know. Or... So it's, it's the lead sound in this. <laughs> yeah, that, I know that. Um, for anyone who's... I tried to keep it away from the mics there so it didn't yep. pop up, but um, <laughs> just for copyright. Um, that's a tune, by the way, from back in the day. Have you got that sound? You that can sound, send yes. Me. I can send you it. It's, um, it's a dinky sound out of the dinky packs. Um, 
there was a there was a few that floated around that was like um Alan Aztec. You don't you remember him from back in the day? No. He used to, he did like a dinky pack, but then there was one and I I remember Dinky though, yeah. 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 Well basically oh, it's it, a label, isn't it? Yeah, the Australian label. And they they had a, a specific sound, obviously yeah. that that, that, that That's sound. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um and a lot of people replicated them in put their own spin on it and put out sample packs and they've been abused over the years but so have you that, got the original dinky pack uh no it's not a dinky pack but i've got, them, got the I'll, sound, I'll send them over sound. um Thank there you. was it'll be well happy with that <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> um, honestly he's been looking for it for ages yeah i i i went through all my hoover sounds and yeah, yeah i couldn't find it it's called uh, on in the pack it's called a ting t-i-n-g because it sounds a bit like a hoover yeah but it's not it's weird yeah i have got the sound though, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's sweet. been hammered over the years that oh yeah, yeah yeah it's that sound in particular is, i mean they use it in bounce still to this day I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah 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 it's very popular yeah um yeah great tune that as well um i just wanted to say as well with your production and stuff obviously we'll just sort of touch on it yeah for the producers out there yep. you did a couple of sample packs as well that are on um toolbox yeah um what 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 brought you on to do that sort of stuff? Uh, um, I had a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> was there was there, uh, was was the people asking for no the, 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 the Tom Parr sound or no? Well, part of doing the label, other people were doing sample packs, so I thought I'll have a bit of that. I'll do my own. Yeah, and that was it really. That was the only reason I did it to be part of the market. Right. Um, because I, have you found a lot of your stuff within when you've put it out and then a couple of months later you've heard oh that's out there oh yeah, yeah. I'll be honest, I've used some of your sounds so <laughs> I use them <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've used them in a in bounce tunes and because oh, obviously, obviously there's such a translation between the two it's almost barely noticeable I uh, really for me bounce was hard out yeah oh absolutely and then it out. then it kind of had its own path so for, I kind of class it as <coughs> hard house really. Yeah. The proper bounce, and when I say proper, I mean the older yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Almost. Be, do you remember before the donk had even arrived, and it was almost like that woodeny bass sound. Like, yeah, like pumping or like. Yeah, it weren't thing. quite a donk, but it yeah. was like the more analog. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then a donk came. <laughs> and then it just people stopped forgetting to put a sub bass in a track yeah, and yeah, put a donk in instead. Yeah, and it was just like yeah. proper oinky and. Oh, <laughs> Terrible. Yeah, there was an era where, if I imagine, if I was around at that time, I'd have probably switched off because I missed that era and it started to get half decent again. Mm. And it, I, I caught it at the right time, but mm. I remember li like listening back to like some old records and it's got like a, some there's just baseless records just because they put a donk in or yeah. and it's or it's another chart remix of of the latest chart tune, but it didn't necessarily fit a dance tune and it's just like. Oh, kill me now, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, yeah, so we're sort of getting into that. I just wanted to know your opinion as well, because obviously I've never really heard you go in this style, and after talking to you mm. for for the last hour or so, it's made me realise that... Well, what's your thoughts on um, Bouncy Hard House? Do you know, like... Uh, your, I hate it. Do you not like it? No. Just, I just, I just out of curiosity, that's all. I, I think... I, hate is a strong word. Yeah. Uh... I dislike a lot of it yeah because it it's not I, I i'm used to what it was like yeah and it'll never be like that it's like the older hard house heads i guess hmm. uh, I, although to be honest i don't i haven't listened to any modern right, bands, okay. so it's a bit ignorant of me to say that yeah yeah my answer is i don't really know because okay. i've not just because obviously it's, that, that that's probably the biggest crossover there is right now to hard house yeah Do you like the bouncy hard house i'm talking the, the line along the lines of like um cheeky tracks no not even no cheeky tracks is, that sounds a little bit more northern i think i'm, I'm talking along the lines like the, it, a lot of people call it midlands bounce so it's like it's like um tom berry uh Zach oh, Ev, yeah. uh so uh, the guy is Johnson. That, so it's it's like it's it's hard, it sounds like hard house, but it's got like a that stuff I can stand. Yeah. But see, I didn't read that. Yeah. Is that what, with Hoovers and stuff in that. Oh, I can't call it bouncy yeah, hard house. That reminds me of the old. Yeah, I oh, like yeah, that because yeah. it's it's more got the hard edge hard house sound to it. Yeah. 
it's the cheesy. I thought you were on about like bounce heaven. Oh no 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 no! no. Like, That's more like the like the northern bounce stuff that I, I would call that. Yeah. To, to like the the reason that I separate it is because um, you should, and so it should be because you go down to the Midlands, right? And they absolutely love that sound. It, yeah. Uh, I, it's very similar to like what like pinup players like. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'd say it's a bit harder than pinup. Yeah yeah yeah. A bit, a bit more ferocious. Yeah, but up here. The, that bouncy hard house, you play that in a in a in a bounce gig up this way, it doesn't really go down well. Too hard. Yeah. It's mm. a, it's a bit because um, it hasn't got the, the cheesy edge to it as well. That's a bit I can't see, I'm a bit of a hypocrite here because I put a lot of cheesy vocals, but then I like to harden it up. Yeah. But I I can't do cheese on cheese. It has to be <laughs> cheese on cheese. It's gotta be cheese with a bit of hardness to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Contrast. Um, <coughs> it's alright if we move on to part two now, so we'll just go yep. over the questions. We're back in two minutes. Alright, how are we doing? Just want to take a second of your time before we start today's episode, and I want to tell you about our Patreon. Um, Patreon is a, a tool that we use to financially support this podcast. For as little as £3 a month, you can support us and what we do. Uh, it pays towards our travel, um, our editing time, um, recording equipment, making things better essentially for the podcast. Um, but in return, we give you at least one bonus episode per month, early access to uh, the public episodes, which you're watching now, so you get these a couple of days early. And also as well, I'll be giving away all my tracks on there. Um, so if you if you subscribe for £3 a month, you might get £10 worth of tracks. Every track that I produce will be going on the, on, on the um, Patreon page. So for as little as £3, you can support the cause. Um, you won't even notice it going out your bank. Sign up now at patreon.com forward slash it's time to refresh. That is patreon.com forward slash it's time to refresh. You know you're a fucking belter. Nice one. Um, back for part two of the podcast. Um, this is the questions uh, we ask every week. So if you've got a question, then just drop us a message. It can be anything at all, as you will hear in a couple of minutes. Um, on the It's Time to Refresh uh, Instagram page or Facebook page. Uh, as I say, just drop a message with your questions. Um, I haven't shown you these questions, as I don't with anybody. But uh, So we're just going in with, this is your first reaction and uh, okay. for, uh, first off-the-cuff answers. Is that all right? Yeah. Excellent. Um, this one is Mara, genuine question. Uh, where do you see raves in 15 years? Do you think, do you think every... Everything else will be like ultra modern raves, or do you think it will be like a little rebellion where it goes back to the underground? Uh, ravers and promoters trying to keep it authentic, dingy, and underground. Congrats on the 1,000 subs. You are kicking it in every week, and that's from Josh Kerwin. I think. Um, I think there'll always be an underground movement, always. Always. Um, that because. Of the powers that be, there's always going to be people that get left out, yeah, and people that make it, and or you know, however you define making it, yeah. So I think it'll always you'll always have your illegal raves. You'll always have that. Um, I mean, I have friends that only prefer an, an illegal rave. Yeah, it's a different vibe, you know. Completely, yeah. Um, I think I, I think with what the way he's worded it there is if it's probably one or the other. I think there's just going to be a bigger divide between the Miami EDM sort of world million pound set DJs and the scabs like us, like the, yeah. the underground DJs. I think it's just going to be a bigger divide. It'll never be mainstream because yeah. of the nature of the music. It's drug music. Yeah, it is. No matter which way you look at it. Absolutely, I, I mean, can agree with that. Um, and that w until drugs are legalized, I think if drugs got legalized, that might make a made make, make uh, sorry that might uh, bring on a major chain in the rave scene. I think so, hundred percent because it's it's part of the rave scene. Yeah, and although I don't do it myself anymore, you can't deny that it isn't. You know, it drives it a lot. I yeah. think the attendance at raves would be a lot less if there wasn't any, like, narcotics involved. Yeah. Absolutely. So if they legalised it, I think it would 
give more freedom. Uh, and people like, for me, for example, there's a lot of people that probably wouldn't go because of the dangers of, hmm. of you know, this, that and the other. And I think that would definitely help. I mean, if you could get some decent MDMA again <laughs> and it was legal, yeah, I think there'd be a boom in rave music. That's inter- That's an interesting um, tip on it, you know. Very, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, I like that. Um, whether it, it doesn't think it'd ever happen, but uh, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, happen, a, no. it's, an interest, <laughs> it's an interesting take, though. Because that's what drove the rave scene, MDMA, yeah. essentially. And I think that's what's been... Um, you know, as that got phased out and it was all about cocaine and ketamine and mm. it wasn't about the dancing anymore, it wasn't about the music anymore. It was more about the drugs than the music and that's when it went downhill Yeah, for me. Yeah. I, um, I, I, I personally have never taken any drugs like before so I can't really... Uh... Oh, you're missing out, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I've never... People say, there are people who've said to me in the past, honestly, if you just... Like, because I had this guy... Uh, this was back in October, I believe. Mm. Uh, this guy came up to me. I've uh, never met him before in my life. Mm. And uh, he says, oh, I watch the podcast. He's, uh, I, I love it every week. And I'm like, oh, yeah, nice one, nice one. And he's like, uh, he says, now I've got name to face. I can come and see you in, like, in raves and stuff. I'm like, oh, nice one. <laughs> and he's obviously been really full on. Uh. I was like, oh, you're having a good night then? And he's like, honestly, mate, I've listened to the podcast and I know you don't take drugs. But he says, I love this tune that you did. And he was well, got him talking about the tune and stuff. Uh-huh. He goes, I would love to give you your first pill and then you listen to your own tune back. You would love it. And I was just thinking, <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I can't imagine anything worse. We, I'm quite self-critical when I hear my tunes in a club because I'm sitting there analysing it like what I could have done production-wise better. Yeah. So imagine if I, if I had a pill and I was just in the middle of the dance floor. Oh, I'd be sitting there like... It takes all that away. Like It allows you to listen to it as a piece of music it yeah, doesn't yeah. Sound, it's, weird, it's very weird actually it's like listening to someone else's music yeah. almost right, even okay. though you know it's your own but you, it takes away that um, critical thinking aspect yeah yeah, uh, yeah. oh well uh, as I say it's, it's, it, it was amazing uh, what was the guy called I'm just going to give you a shout out now in fact maybe not because I've just mentioned you're taking drugs I don't know <laughs> but, uh, but big shout to you you know who you are uh, if you watch it every week anyways um, but I was like I was proper amazed because his words these were his genuine words he went right what it is right I'd love to give you your first pill right <laughs> get on the dance floor go uh, someone tell someone to play your track and just listen to it you'll be taken away mate I was like yeah, that's not realistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not realistic. Obviously, uh, intoxicated and whatever else, but it was yeah. it was phenomenal. Um, yeah, so next, we'll go on to the next question. Yeah. Uh, hi, mate. I saw the Kevin and Perry versus Human Traffic clip you put out. Is there any other rave party films that you'd recommend? Um, obviously, if you haven't seen last week's episode, uh, we talked about... Kevin and Perry. Kevin and Perry. Human I, um, I, put, I put it... Uh, Put, me and my missus watched it again for like a millionth time uh, the other day because it's been put on Netflix so I thought it was essential watching <laughs> I'm, um, I'm not into rave films are you not? I think um, there's some stuff in life that should be kept on sad if right, that makes okay. sense yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think it's just glor- glor- glorifying taking drugs and yeah. although I used to do all that I just don't think it's it's although Kevin Perry doesn't really yeah. human trafficking does and I don't know I, it it's a bit of an embarrassment to the music I think sometimes it might come across as cheesy uh, yeah. we had this debate basically um, Al who was on the podcast last week said um, that human traffic come across as more real because it gives you the journey of of that that person's weekend whereas I preferred Kevin and Perry because it was. Um, bit, it's more aimed at the music. And yeah, like, I, agree. I think the only time they take drugs on it is um, when they take the dodgy pills and he's sick over the balcony. That's the only part that yeah. you see drugs as. as yeah, such. it is. Yeah, you're right there. I think um, the music's far better in Kevin and Perry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I uh, think the human traffic was more aimed at the culture than the music. Yeah, wasn't it? And um, but either way, I think they're both quite cringy in their own ways. Yeah, is there, is there any that you would that you'd recommend, or is it just a complete no? Um, 
I, I like documentaries on bands. So I, yeah, so I watch stuff on Oasis or, uh, you know. That Nebworth one's really good. That new oh, one, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Oh, Took me ages to get hold of it, but... Uh, same, but... Um, it is really good. Stuff like that, I like. I like... Um, it's like... Documentation uh, yeah, rather than replication. Yeah, so I'm, I'm more about... Like, I love history and, you know, um, documents on old synthesizers or... Yeah. The Same rave way. side, <clears throat> not so much because that was never really a big part of my life. Raving, yeah. I mean, the the DJing was, but the going out raving. You were on the other side as such. Yeah, because I, uh, I didn't know it, but I had autism. I only got diagnosed two years ago. Yeah, and um, I I never wanted to go out much. I, that's part of the reason I wanted to make music as well because it was an escapism yeah it still is my escapism so uh, it's how I express myself it's how I de-stress it's how I um, so I just get any any feelings or emotions out I can do it musically excellent, excellent. Yeah. It's fantastic like you don't realise how much you can help a person as well mentally like yeah. Like if that's your escapism and your you you portraying your emotions, it's something that might have been a build up if it wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? And I, I've suffered from severe mental health issues. Um, music's been a big help for me. Uh, it's also been a, a very unhelpful at the same time. Yeah. You know, you got people who are so called mental health ambassadors. Yeah. Going around ruining people's mental health. I suppose. Um, Arguably, um, and I just think <sighs> music has been my saviour um, because without it, I won't be enough. Yeah, but there's, I, I'm going to say this objectively. This isn't like a, it's not what I think. Mm. This is what I think everyone would agree as well. That's why I think it's objective. Yeah. That take all these these mental health ambassadors out or whatever it is. Yeah. Right. The music itself is such a cure. Yeah. Would you say? I, yeah, I think it's the cure. Unfortunately, the the drugs I took at a younger age certainly didn't help. Yeah. And um, I, obviously, I didn't know I was autistic and I was obviously self-medicated. Yeah. And it's terrible, you know. It's the same with the alcohol. Uh, I was drinking a lot, taking... And I didn't know why. You, you, you just don't feel like you fit in. Yeah. With when you have autism, that's the only way to describe it. Yeah, and um, I couldn't understand why, and I, I all I wanted to be was normal. Yeah, so that was my from a very early. I mean, from fourteen. Yeah, um, and then most of my young adult life. Did you have a feeling what of what it was? I or? knew I wasn't normal. Yeah, my my mum and dad sent me to a psychiatrist when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I was the I was very quiet and. Um, they knew something wasn't right, but mm. they never diagnosed me with autism. Mm. Um, then as I struggled throughout my adult life, um, when I met my ex-wife, she said, I think you've got autism, you need to go and get checked out. So I went and uh, I'm, I'm a level two, and there's three levels. Three is like you're in a wheelchair, and yeah. then you've got level two, and then you've got level one. Level two's the top end of uh, high functioning right it's it's like i'm high functioning but i shouldn't be allowed in society for too long kind yeah. of thing <laughs> yeah makes sense yeah yeah and then what level one is where level it's one's like, like asperger's yeah like you're uh, very mild kind of this see this is what i should the internet is not designed for somebody like me. This is yeah. why I got into a lot of trouble. Because I, when I say things, I'll go, uh, you, you daft cunt. Yeah. If I type that, yeah. which I have in the past, you can read that in a million different ways. And, yeah. and then, obviously... There's no tone there, is there, to, to the voice? There's no tone, and I swear, and, and when I'm not on a podcast, every other word's fuck this, fuck that, you know, and... I write like that too, so it's come. I've come across as an aggressive, angry, um, somebody who I'm not because mm. of the way I speak a lot of the time. Yeah. Hopefully, people watching this can see that you're just because like I said to you off pod, 
I thought I think our sense of humour is like really good because you're quite dry. Yeah. And a lot of people will be able to maybe notice that on the podcast. And well, hopefully, yeah, I don't. I don't want everyone to upset anybody, and yeah. I've never. I've only responded to what's been said to me. <coughs> I've yeah. never attacked somebody. <coughs> Oh well. Um, so well, we've got off the subject, but um, <laughs> is there any films that you would recommend? Uh, I made a list because uh, I knew I'd forget on the spot when I asked the question. Mm. So I did Weekender. That was a, a, a very rave drug culture based movie, which is I really enjoyed it. Okay. Um, there was have you ever seen House Party from the late eighties, early nineties? It rings a bell. Kid and Play. Uh, that was a really good uh, it's not a rave as such but it's like mm. uh, one's an MC and one's a DJ and they do, they, <laughs> they, they do it's house it's house party it's really really good story yeah uh, would recommend that because it's, it's not really about rave culture but it's really good um, what was it oh 24 hour party people do you know the one with um, Alan Partridge yeah I love Steve Coogan yeah, yeah. and he plays um, he plays the guy from yeah, he runs uh, uh, the old. Uh, is he called Rick? Not Rick. Uh, Tony. Tony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony. Uh, bloody. He he managed the Mondays, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember his yeah. name. It's doing me heading off the top of my head. Tony. But, bloody. Yeah, we'll it's doing me that. But yeah, yeah. I know. It's like, and I and I watched the, watched that film and I thought uh, this is this is. This is amazing. See just, that? I think that's a better clubbing film than than Human Traffic and yeah. Just because it's more well, it's more northern in it. It's more. I'm not saying that Human Traffic kind of is. No, it's not it's southern. Yeah, they're it? southerners. Yeah, yeah. I, I think because it's based in Manchester, I prefer it because it's more. You know, it's more my up here, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and the last question for today is. <laughs> Uh, this isn't a question. I, I got this message, and it, do you know when you say when you write something in, in um, and it can come across as a million different ways? Yeah. I read this and it sounded so aggressive. Okay. <laughs> right, you ready? Just facts here. So it starts off quite in the face. Right. Uh, Chinese is the best takeaway, no arguments, but I do enjoy Indian more in a restaurant than a Chinese. It's just a way of life. What's your order when you order from an India? They haven't put Indian, they put India. So I mean, uh, and that's from, all right? They have put the name, but obviously they want to remain anonymous. They put anonymous connoisseur. Uh, yeah, so uh, Chinese, I love. Yeah, love Chinese. We always talk about it on here. That's why I think that's what he's getting a, getting that when he's talking about <laughs> talking about Chinese. I have to be half cut to eat an Indian. Right. So what's your go-to order then? That's what he's asking. Uh, chicken tikka masala, uh, onion barge, pulao rice, pashwari naan. It's that is yeah, the yeah. uh, and maybe chicken pakoras. Nice. It's very, very similar to what I get to do <laughs> there. Right. So, so we, me and my missus go, and it's um, on a on a they do like a Sunday deal where it's like five courses or whatever. They claim it's five courses, but one of them is like a cup of tea yeah, yeah, or a coffee. Do you know what I mean? Uh, um, and I can't remember how much it is. They put the price up recently. I know that. Um, just like everything else. Um, yeah. So I, I go for like an onion bhaji, um, chicken pakora is the first like two things. Mm. And then I'd go for peshwari naan or a keema naan, depending on what Keema naan, that's what I was on about. Oh, keema naan. Yeah, right. with the meat in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah, red, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's really nice. Oh, yeah. Um, and then from my mains, right, me and my obviously yeah. share food, right? So, yeah. so what I do is I get a hot one and she gets a whatever she likes, which is never hot. So it's, I get uh, a taste uh, a bit of both, creamy and thing. Uh, so I go for um, a chicken boona, like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then she'll go for um, something quite mild. So I've got a bit of like best a, of both. Like a or something. She won't. She won't touch it. Or I, well, I won't let her touch a coma. <laughs> if you got it all, don't get a coma, or we won't share. Right. So that's what we're like. Yeah. Um, I, she, won't, I won't eat coma either. It's it's very. It's it too coconut taste, for me. It's well, I, I think it tastes a bit um, like nothing. Yeah. Like it, there's you eat, you're consuming something, but it's a bit tasteless. It's like cream and chicken. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> so, um, what is it? The one she gets. Um, I can't remember the name of it, the one she, uh, go to one, but it, uh, Pasanda. Pasanda. Yeah, it's a bit more tasty, but it's got the, the, that thing to it. Yeah. Um, and I will get pilau rice, um, 
And obviously, I like getting the 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 papa doms with oh, the, yeah, the, the three. That, yeah. So I like, I like uh, the mango chutney and the mint yogurt. Oh, like oh, I like the mint yogurt. I don't like mango chutney, believe it or not. Oh, but I don't like marmalade, and it reminds me of marmalade. I don't like marmalade, to be fair. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, obviously, I've never been to... This is another thing. Do you know when you eat Chinese food, right? Yeah. You eat Chinese food, it's sort of similar. Where Obviously, you get your better ones in your essence wherever you go. It's, yeah. it's like if you order, um, for instance, uh, Szechuan, it would be sort of similar everywhere you go. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I've, I've noticed, wherever you, whatever Indian you go to, you can never get one that tastes any remotely sim- like similar. No. If I go and get a tikka masala from one... Sometimes it's a completely different colour to the one you get. It's very get, uh, like red ones and yeah, like yeah, orange yeah. ones and I think it maybe I don't know what it is, but they're just different recipes or what. But I think they isn't it different the different regions they come from and stuff like that, they all have different takes, don't they? So that's just me being uneducated then, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, um so what I asked everyone before we close up, uh, is you're about to get the electric chair because you've wrote something online that somebody's took with the wrong end of the stick because of the way you write. Yeah. Uh, now you're getting the electric chair and they've said to you, you're getting your final meal. It can be anything you want. You can have start, a main dessert and a beverage. Roast dinner. Roast dinner? Full roast dinner with all the trimmings. Right. Are you I'll having a starter? For, no. No. I'll go through the roast dinner. So I'll have uh, chicken. Yep. Uh, honey roasted parsnips. Lovely. Sugar carrots. I've never had that before. It's just uh, boiled carrots in uh, sugar water. Oh. It's just like a sweetness added to it. Nice. Um, broccoli. Yep. Uh, garlic and rosemary, roast potatoes, cooked in goose fat. Oh, um, winner. Pig, that is a winner. Pigs in blankets. Yep. So you do chipolatas with smoked. Smoked. It has to be smoked, smoked. yeah. Uh, gravy, homemade gravy from the stock I get from the chicken. Yep. Um... What else? Stuffing, Yorkshire puddings, you name it, just ev- everything. I know where I want to come for Christmas dinner now. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, homemade Yorkshire's, yeah? Yep. Fantastic, fantastic. That's amazing. I don't, I only do homemade on Christmas and special occasions, though. Yeah, you're so much to look forward to, I suppose. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's who I am. Um, what, what are you washing it down with? Um, if I'm going to die, probably a pint of vodka. Pint of vodka? Mm. That's harsh, that. <laughs> nice way to go, I suppose. Uh, just want to say thank you for coming on the podcast, mate. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Um, and do you want to tell people about your album before we go? Yes, yeah, so my album's coming out in June 2023. Uh, 12 tracks coming out on a CD and then it'll be USB. Um, all original, um, peak time, banging Tom Parr music. Excellent, excellent. And where, where are you getting it? Uh, where are you selling it at? Where's the It'll albums? be hopefully available on uh, toolboxdigital.com right. and, and toolboxdigitalshop.com. And also, you said you're going to do a run of CDs and USBs, right? Yeah, so the CDs, uh, we're going to do 14 tracks, and there'll only be 14 tracks on the CD. Yep. There'll only be 12 tracks on the USB, so you're going to get two free tracks on the CD. Fantastic. Um, I won't lie, the reason for that is um, because it's expensive to make the CDs. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not bothered about making a return, I just want to shift them. Yeah. Um, so hence the two free bonus tracks. Yeah, your followers as well. Uh, like I've, uh, For me, if I've got somebody I'm a fan of, right, mm. I love to have a physical holder. Copy, like yeah. USBs, it's all right, but just go, it, it's to shit, look at it. it. Like, it's, like, this is why I'm doing the CDs, yeah. because I... I I wanted a, something to have. You yeah, know. like as I say as well, a lot of people don't have CD players nowadays. I still do because I'm a, as I say, I like my CDs. Yeah. I still buy CDs and vinyl, but it's nothing better than like opening up the the sleeve and like the reading. Smell and, of it, yeah, yeah. You know when you take the plastic off, yeah. it's that fresh paper smell and yeah. you know, all of that. I love all of that. And, yeah, it's uh, fantastic. The USBs I'm doing purely just for the DJs. Yeah, the CDs are for the the more the fan. Right, I think. Is it going to be a mix, the CD? Yeah, so the CD I'm going to have um, uh, is two disc, one mix, one unmixed. Fantastic, fantastic, mate. I look forward to hearing that. Just want to say thank you for coming on. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Yep. Uh, see you again soon. Thank you.